Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Passionate about creating great teams, Patrick Glinchoni has used his practical frameworks to help countless leaders and organizations improve their teamwork, clarity, and engagement. The founder and president of The Table Group, Patrick is the author of 11 books, which have sold over 5 million copies. His work has been featured in Harvard Business Review, Fortune, and Inc., and the Wall Street Journal called him, quote, one of the most in-demand speakers in America. Today, we dive deep into the content of Patrick's classic book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. We talk about the root causes of each dysfunction and the keys to overcoming them to become a high-performing team. Conflict, silos, accountability, difficult conversations, we cover them all today. So if you want to get better as a leader or as a team, keep listening. Here's my conversation with Patrick Lincioni. So Patrick Lincioni, what an absolute pleasure. As I told you before we went on the air, I've read every single one of your books, listened to them probably more than once. So thank you for taking the time to do this. That means you've read my books three times more than my wife. (laughs) I've had books come out. She's like, I should read that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes, she should. She should, as should your boys. But I want to start with the five dysfunctions of a team and and, and sort of dig into that a little bit. you know, a lot of organizations fail to achieve teamwork because they maybe unknowingly fall sort of prey to these five pitfalls. And, and you start with sort of in the pyramid, the absence of trust. Can you define that for me a little bit in this context and then we can dig into it a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, people on a team have to trust each other in a way that's different than they might think. Sometimes people think as long as you know somebody really well, you can trust them because you can predict one another's behavior. But when we talk about trust, it's, it's about vulnerability-based trust. And that is people that can be buck naked with each other. They, they'll tell you what they're good at and what they're not good at. They'll admit when they make a mistake. They'll acknowledge when somebody's better than them at something or has a better idea. And they'll apologize if they do something wrong. That kind of vulnerability is invaluable. And when you can get people on a team to be vulnerably trustworthy with one another, it changes everything. You know, with with the leaders that are listening, what can they do to build trust between team members if maybe they sense that those behaviors you just listed sort of aren't happening? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. We actually take teams through a couple of simple exercises that in a matter of hours can change the trust dynamics on the team. And the first one is, is seems ridiculously simple, but I was just doing this with some people that I've known for a long time the other day, and I was amazed at what I didn't know about them. And it's, we call it their personal histories exercise. And to start by sitting down and just going around the table and everybody telling each other, here's where I grew up. Here's how many kids were in my family. Here's the order I was in. And this was the most difficult challenge of my childhood, not my inner childhood, just being a kid. And it is nuts how people that have known each other for a long time, Molly, will still say, oh my gosh, I never realized you went through that. And it changes their whole dynamic because now they, they have empathy. They understand why a person is the way they are. They connect on a different level, and it changes everything. And it's so simple. That takes 20 minutes. And then we go one step further where we have people do some sort of, some sort of tool around um, personality, like the Myers-Briggs or DISC or something. That's not evaluative. They're all fine. They're all good types. And then those two things, three hours after or two hours after having a conversation about that, everybody is dealing with each other in a completely different way. And so by knowing somebody better, right, you do this work, you've done this work for so long and you do it so well, by knowing somebody better, right, by knowing maybe what was their biggest challenge as a child or things like that, tell me a little bit about how that connects and relates to trust and, and of course, the second dysfunction, which is conflict, right? So get me inside of that a little bit more. So if I'm a leader listening, I'm like, okay, cool, I trust you, I know you better, but how does that make us do better work together? Yeah, let me give an example of this. So we worked with this executive who was the chief operating officer of this really big insurance company. And all the people that worked for him were frustrated at him because he would never trust them to make financial decisions on their own. And they, they, 
jumped to the conclusion, they made the fundamental attribution error, if you will, that he was just an untrusty person, he didn't care for them, and he, wasn't, he just wasn't that great a guy. And they were frustrated. So there was a lot of conflict, but not very good conflict. So we do the, the personal histories exercise, right? Mm-hmm. And the guy says, he never told us before, well, I grew up in Chicago in the 60s, and my family was so poor. We had to go outside to go to the restroom, and our electricity got cut off a lot. We were dirt poor. And so one of the people said, is that why you don't trust us with the budget? And he said, absolutely. I'm just, I just never want my company or my family to be poor. Mm. And suddenly they went from like, this guy's a jerk to, oh my gosh, now I understand. I'd be like that too. And they could then have a conversation about it, which would lead them to have good conflict around budget things without the history that they didn't understand. So that's where vulnerability-based trust and, and knowing one another and being able to understand why people behave the way they do leads to better discussions, better decisions, and better interaction. Sure. And often, right, leaders think, and I think a lot of people think, we all think, and you know, that vulnerability is, is not something that we need to display, but in fact, it drives connection, right? Oh, it's without it, you can't have a good marriage, you can't have a good friendship, you can't have good relationships at work. You know, it's funny, uh, you, you've dealt with a lot of athletes. Um, last year, when the Packers were almost, they were doing terrible, I don't mean this previous year, the, the year before that, and they turned it around and almost made it to the Super Bowl, we read an article in ESPN, and we didn't know it at the time, that Aaron Rodgers said he read The Five Dysfunctions, and it was the vulnerability and conflict stuff that helped him realize how to be a better teammate. And he said that's when he got that, he goes, that's when we turned it around. God, pinch yourself. That's good stuff. I know. It was, it was nuts. And in, in fact, two days ago, a friend, a friend of mine said he was at a pro-am golf tournament and met him, and he talked to him about it. And he was saying, oh, yeah, that book is great. It really helped us deal with each other differently on a team. <laughs> well, he ought to sign a jersey and send it to you at least, man. <laughs> I, I should ask him, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, the second dysfunction you talk about is sort of the fear of conflict, right? And so, wh- you know, I guess, what's the difference between the fear of conflict that's detrimental to a team and sort of healthy conflict? Can you kind of help delineate those for us? Sure. So, the Molly, the, the thing is, without trust, without that vulnerability-based trust, you can't have good conflict. Because conflict without trust is just manipulating to try to win the argument, if you will. Conflict is good when there's trust, because when you know that that other person is going to say, hey, I'm wrong, or, you know, that's a better idea, you've convinced me, or, you know, I've been a jerk, I'm sorry. When you know that other person is fully willing and capable of being that vulnerable, you know that disagreeing with them is only motivated by the pursuit of truth or finding the best possible answer, not winning for the sake of winning. So that's why we always start with trust. Sure. When you can get vulnerable with somebody and have that kind of relationship, when you argue, you know the other person isn't doing it to pull you down. They're doing it to try to make the team better. So they build on each other, I'm hearing you say. Absolutely. Okay, okay. You know, and I think a lot of people have a hard time dealing with conflict, right? A lot of people avoid it. What's the advice that you give leaders or, or even their employees up to a leader, or vice versa to to approach those difficult conversations that maybe need to happen in a way that can drive more productive results? Well, the first thing we say is start with trust. Okay, so whatever you think, like I think we trust each other pretty well, double down on trust because then you're going to have a better chance. The second thing is this, prepare yourself to be uncomfortable. The problem is people say, gee, I'll do anything for my company except have a difficult conversation. Right. Because you're halfway through that conversation, you think, oh, this person's going to hate me. This is really awful. Our society says affirm everyone and everything. Don't disagree. And that's a dangerous thing on a team. You're supposed to have exhausting, uncomfortable, difficult discussions during meetings. And when you push through it, at the end of that meeting, you feel you admire one another more and you've made a better decision and, it, and you gradually learn how to go there without such fear. What advice do you give people that just naturally seem to have a really hard time with this, dealing with conflict and sort of approaching those conversations? I mean, starting with trust, anything else tactically that you'd say, you know, hey, think about it this way or do this. These are ways to sort of start to phrase those sort of conversations or start them. Anything like that? Yes. I, 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 a couple of things. First of all, what I tell them is if you don't disagree with somebody, if you have a difference of opinion with somebody and you don't air it, You think like, well, I'm avoiding a difficult moment, but in fact, you're postponing it and making it worse because when we don't have disagreement with people around issues, it's going to ferment and eventually it's going to resurface as a personal disagreement. 
And so what I tell them is this, even though in that moment you're going to be so tempted, you're even going to think you're doing something good and kind, know that you are only guaranteeing that it's going to come out later in a really destructive way. And that's enough to scare them to go, okay, we'll do it. The other thing I tell them is the next time it comes up on your team, if you're the leader especially, but even if you're not, the next time there's an uncomfortable moment, stop and interrupt people when they're, when they're starting to have that disagreement and remind them that what they're doing is really good for the team. Mm, okay. Give them real-time permission. Got it. And those are the things that even the greatest um, fearers of conflict, that'll make them want to do it for the right reason. So as a leader, if you've got uh, teammates that are having a tough conversation, just interrupt them and say, hey, the guys, this is great stuff. Keep going. Exactly. We, okay, we'll take as much time as we need. This is what we need to be doing. And that sounds counterintuitive to interrupt them, but again, I've done it with executives. They'll be in a meeting and you can tell. You'll always know. You can see they're getting a little tense with yep, each other yep, and they're sure. feeling like, oh, I'm doing something wrong. I go, hey, wait, you guys, you know this conversation you're having right now? I can tell that you're getting a little tense about it. This is great. This is actually one of the signs of a great team. So keep going. And, and it's the nuttiest thing, Molly. Their stress in that moment will drain away and they'll go right back into the issue. Mm-hmm. I used to always say, and I still do sometimes, that you know, you want a problem to get really good, just sort of put it in a Petri dish and just set it to the right there, or leave it alone, and let it go. Because exactly. it'll get good. It'll get good if you You know, a, a guy in my office, this is going to sound a little... Um, he, his grandfather had a saying, and that is, eat the crap appetizer, because if you don't, you're going to have to eat the crap meal. <laughs> I love it. It's true. It's true. And that sounds pretty gross, but it's like, you've got to deal with it now, because it's, it's only going to get bigger and worse. So deal with it when you can. And the third dysfunction of a team is, is the lack of commitment, and which you sort of talk about in terms of clarity and buy-in. What do you think holds people back from commitment? Well, and here's the interesting thing. It's the lack of conflict. See, I've come to the conclusion that people don't buy into a decision, like truly actively buy into it, if they don't weigh in on that decision. That doesn't mean they have to agree, because I hate consensus. But if you want people to buy into a decision, you need to say, I want to know what you think. I want you to weigh in. I'm going to consider what you said. I'm not necessarily going to do what you want, but it's going to depend on the merit of this. And as the leader, I need to make a decision, but I want everybody to tell me what they think. When human beings speak up, share their opinions, and know they're heard, they are immensely, I mean, exponentially more likely to be able to commit to that decision than if they never spoke up. Even if they don't agree. Even if they don't agree. That's the crazy thing. That's interesting. Because, I mean, most people are really pretty reasonable, and they're like, hey, you heard me. You listened to me. Our kids are like that, too. It's like, well, Dad, just listen. I, okay, okay, let me go, and I'll listen to you. And at the end of it, I go, well, I, I appreciate that, Casey, but here's why I'm making a decision. I get where you're coming from, but this is the deal. He's much more likely to go, okay, you heard me and I understand your reasoning. I'll do this. Wow. That's interesting for sure. Well, I think in one of your many books that I've read, like I said, I've read them all that. Do you recommend that people inside of meetings, if somebody is really quiet and they're not saying something that they do, that the leader really gets it out of them one way or another, what they're thinking? Absolutely. Most people that are like that, will share with you their opinion if asked. And they'll usually come up with something amazing and you'll think, oh my gosh, how many more of those do you have? And it's up to the leader to know their people. Sometimes they have to, you know, I'm an extrovert. So if I have four good ideas, I'm going to say 10 and you're going to have to sift through the 10 to find the four good ones. Mm -hmm. And introverts will have eight good ideas. They'll tell you three and you got to ask them about the other five. And so leaders have to know how to, how to do that. And too often we go, well, they're quiet. They probably, if they had something to say, they'd say it. But oftentimes in meetings, people that are more introverted, a little bit more laid back about things, aren't going to fight to get their ideas heard. And that's why we have to really draw them out. And that's a, that's a service to them and the team. Mm -hmm. And so is that just to tell me what you're thinking? What are the kinds of questions you like to prompt people with to get that out of somebody? Ooh, I love to do this. My team always gives me a hard time about it but they like it because it works. I will say, okay, we're going to make a decision. And I will stop and go, okay, everybody tell me what you think the answer is, but don't say it out loud. Everybody come up with, it, with your answer. Write it down or just commit to it. And then I'll go and I'll ask people one at a time. And it is nuts how many times somebody who would not have spoken up because I actually made them commit to it and not say what the, the person before them said, but really commit to their decision, how we'll learn a lot more from that. And I assume you probably don't let them go, well, I, you know what, what Johnny said, I like that. I, I kind of no, agree no, with Johnny. No. You, don't, you don't go for that either, yeah. I bet, do you? In fact, it's a good idea to ask them first, Got ask it. those people okay. earlier. Cool, cool. You talked about commitment and consensus. And can you talk about that a little bit? Because I think sometimes people, me included, confuse commitment and consensus a little bit. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. You know, what you want is commitment, which is everybody to walk out of the room and go, okay, I'm in, I'm, I'm going to support this. And what you don't want is for people to, to hold back their disagreements and then later on have it come out when they didn't really get behind something. But that doesn't mean they have to agree. Intel, the, the computer chip manufacturer, used to have a saying and a philosophy, and I think they've let go of it a little bit, which is not a good thing, but it was disagree and commit. If you were in football, I'd like this. Go to practice and have it out with your coach about why you think you should get the ball more and why you think that'll help the team. And then he's either going to listen to you and say, okay, or say, no, but here's the deal. And then, but by the time you get to the game, I don't want you talking about it in the huddle. Sure, sure. Or in an office by the water cooler, right? Right. Got so it. it's okay to go, well, coach, I still disagree with you, but I hear what you're saying and I'm going to go block like crazy in the game. But what you can't have people do is say, well, I wasn't, I didn't get to speak my piece. I still don't agree with it. And so I'm going to go and I'm probably not going to block that hard because what the hell, they're not going to throw me the ball anyway. So get it out early. The likelihood that somebody's going to commit is so much. It's most human beings can support something they didn't agree with as long as it's not unethical or immoral. Sure. As long as they know they were heard and they understand why that ultimate decision was made. So commitment requires conflict. Conflict requires trust. See, they totally build on one another. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. if you take one of them out, the whole thing falls. Right, right. And the next one's accountability, right? So the avoidance of accountability is a dysfunction. And what are some of the ways that teams can, can create more accountability to drive better results, right? Well, and Molly, this is the biggest area of uh, defect on most teams, and that is people do not want to turn to one another and say, listen, that wasn't quite good enough. You need to do better. Even more than conflict. It's one thing to have a disagreement around, like, what should we do? But when they actually have to turn to a team member and say, you need to try harder or you need to do this better, human beings hate doing this. Now, here's how it ties to commitment. If they didn't really buy into the decision, why in the world would you think you're going to hold them accountable? So if, my, if, I'm, if I'm in the huddle and I know this guy's pissed off about not getting the ball, why in the world am I going to say, you got to block better? Because I know the guy doesn't care. Sure. But if, if we went through this as a team and committed, now I know that when I say that to him, he's going, yeah, I, I committed to do this. So you holding me accountable is just reminding me of something I want to do. So that's why the best thing you can do for accountability is actually make sure everybody is totally committed. Here, I have a great story. I had 15, 11-year-olds in my conference room here at work yesterday because my son plays lacrosse, and we had rain, and the coaches brought them over here so I could talk to them about teamwork. Ah, Gee, that's a special, what a lucky, blessed team. That's cool. Well, it was so cool. 11-year-olds, I mean, they're like bouncing off the walls because we gave them pizza and Coke and stuff. Right. but, but <laughs> but, but then I made them go around the room and talk about humility and talk about vulnerability and stuff in a way that 11-year-olds can hear. And these kids were saying, yeah, when I score a goal, sometimes I celebrate for myself too much. I need to go and thank the guy who threw the ball to me and the guys who played defense. And they committed to one another that they were going to hold each other accountable for this. And one kid said, I don't listen to the coaches enough. And they all laughed and started clapping because they knew it was true. And I want to do that better. So now they're going to hold him accountable for that. And I love that you did that with that team, by the way. That is, um, w- wow, that's awesome. And, and so they're 11, right? And a lot 11. of people, you, right, and at the table group. And they got it. See, now that's pretty incredible. That's awesome. But they had to commit to it in front of everybody in order to know that they could now hold each other accountable. Sure, sure. So if I'm a leader, though, and I'm listening, and I've got a team, and I want to create more accountability, what are some of the tools that you recommend that people do? Because clearly... There's got to be clear accountability, right? Like there, I would imagine, and I know you talk about clarity and accountability and how they go together a little bit. Tell me about how you create structure, if you will, um, around accountability. And maybe at the table group, you have tools for that for people. But to me, that feels like an important component to ensure it actually drives the results. You know, we do this exercise with teams because there's two kinds of accountability, Molly. There's behavioral accountability and like um, output of accountability, performance. Now, and they're both important, but behavioral comes first. Because if you wait for somebody, for their numbers to show and hold them, it's like a football player, their attitude, if, if a guy, and I hate to come back to sports, but you, you've worked I with so many athletes. I love it. No, I'm in, I'm in on it. So if a guy is coming to practice late and he's not pr- working out hard and he's doing all that, are you going to wait to see if he fumbles in the game or are you going to hold him accountable for the behavior that is the predictor of results? You're going to go to the behavior. If my kid comes home from, from school every day and he's got, his, he hasn't, they won't cut his hair and he, doesn't, and he doesn't go to bed till late and his eyes seem glazed over like there's some substance abuse problem, I'm not going to go, well, honey, let's just wait to see how his grades look. Right. 
Right. You're saying look at the process, right? Look at the process. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the behaviors precede the results. So, so you have to do both of those. But here's so what we do with teams, uh, Molly, to give them an, a sense of improving accountability. We do this th- thing called the team effectiveness exercise where we say, okay, let's go around the table and everybody write down, don't say it out loud, write down one thing, the one thing about everyone else on the team other than yourself that they do really well that makes the team better. I don't mean like, so you're in charge of accounting and you, you know all about accounting. That's, that's their job. I mean like, what is it that they bring in terms of their behavior and their attitude that really helps the team? Like they say the, they say the hard thing at a meeting or they're always willing to help somebody beyond their area, whatever else it is. So write down the one big thing that they do that makes the team better. So everybody, they take 15 minutes, they look around them, look at each other and they write one thing down. Now write down the one thing they do that sometimes hurts the team that you think they need to to be aware of and do differently. Mm. And they're like, okay, they're kind of laugh, but they do it. They do it. Mm-hmm. And then we start with the leader and we say, okay, let's go with the leader. What, what did you guys say the leader does really well? And one by one, we go around the room. Everybody looks at the leader and says, you do this well, you do this well. The leader's like, wow, that's great to hear. It's usually consistent. The leader's really feeling like, man, they really get this. <laughs> I'm the man. <laughs> now tell her or now tell him the one thing that they need to do differently. It is nuts. After really telling them what they love about the leader, how honest they are and how well the leader takes it because it's usually consistent and they know they've just been honored and, and they will tell them the hard truth. Like the, you really break things down during meetings when you do this and the leader's like, yep, yep. Okay. So then they've got their one or two things they got to work on. And then we go to the next person on the team and do all their positives. And then the, their big weakness at the end of two hours, that takes two hours. It is the cheapest, fastest, and most effective 360 program you can do because one, people should say it right to each other, and they're more capable of that than we know. Two, they should give them the one thing, not the 10 things, the one thing they need to improve on. Then at the end of that, we say this, you have just committed to the one thing, and you're giving everyone at this table permission to hold you accountable. That's an act of love. When you see them do that one thing, it is your duty and a commitment to them. See, people don't like to hold each other accountable because they think they're being mean or judgmental. When you're doing it to help them. And so we do that exercise and we say, okay, in three months, we're going to come back and we want to find out if you're getting better at it and if people are calling you out on it. How often do you encourage teams and organizations to do that exercise, for example? A couple of times a year? Oh, how often? We, yeah. we have them check in on it every three months or okay. so. Okay. But just to check in on it. Okay. And the more they do it, the probably the easier it gets, right? Oh my gosh. And do they go deeper as they keep going, right? Maybe they keep getting more and more and everybody keeps getting better and better. <laughs> you know, they do. And, and it changes the culture. But like, so let me give you an example for me. Okay. So I'm an ENFP in the Myers-Briggs. People might know, but that means I like to start things. I don't always like to finish things. I think a new idea is great. Um, oh, look, a bird, a squirrel. But, but then <laughs> I get bored easily, right? Mm-hmm. That's not an excuse, but it's a reality. It's, it's kind of how God wired me. So we talk about that in, in our offsite, and then we get to the part where we say, what do I need? To, what am I good at? What am, and they're like, you're a great, a great ideas, Pat, and you encourage us, and what's not so good? Well, sometimes, Pat, you kind of distract us by moving on to the next thing before we finish, and maybe you don't appreciate all the detail that has to go into getting things done. That would, that's a very common one, very accurate one. Well, the next time I go to a meeting and I start coming up with a new idea, they have immensely better permission now to go, hey, you know that thing we talked about at the offsite? <laughs> this is one of those moments. I don't feel judged. I don't feel like they're, they're doing something wrong. We already talked about it. And so three months later, we'll check in and just go, hey, how am I doing you guys on distracting? Yeah, you're doing better. You kind of did it the other day, but generally you're getting better. That's a good thing. Sure. So what's interesting in full disclosure, you just described probably what my team would say about me, I think. I, I'm the same way, right? So what do you do with all your ideas? I mean, what do you do with them? Do, just because you got to park them, you can't, but you don't want to lose them. They're probably pretty awesome for you. Maybe not me, but for you, I'm sure they are. It's all about context. You have different kinds of meetings. I wrote a book called Death by Meeting. We kind of go into this. Love it. You have different kinds of meetings for different kinds of things. So we'll say, hey, we're going to have a meeting. We're going to put these ideas. It's going to be totally ideas. But that weekly staff meeting, when we need to go through and say, how are we doing? What's going on? How are we getting that thing done? That's not a time for new ideas and brainstorming. It's a time for tactical review, problem solving, and moving things forward. I have to hold those in during those meetings. 
and I have to save them for the right context because at other, in some meetings, I'm the star of the show. They love that, like more ideas. The other meetings, I have to take a back seat to the people that are really good at operations and I have to become their supporter during mm, that meeting. Okay, awesome. Thanks for clarifying. So the final dysfunction is the inattention to results. Right. You know, so how do you approach goal setting in a team environment and how does this lay over top of the other four that we just talked about? Yeah, well, when we talk about the inattention to results, and this is where sports is a great example, although it, but it only explains really well how it happens in business too. Everybody is ultimately fairly results-oriented. It depends on are they the collective results of the team or are they the individual results that you have? In other words, am I more concerned about my pet projects or am I concerned about the, the well-being of the entire company? The best example is Scottie Pippen, who years ago, the, the famous story after Jordan retired, Pippen became the best player on the team. And he was very results oriented, but it was mostly about him. And they got into the playoffs and um, they were tied with two seconds to go. And the, the Chicago Bulls executive team was in the audience at one of my talks and they confirmed this to be true. And they called timeout and the coach, Phil Jackson, said, hey, um, the ball's going to go to Tony Kukoc for the last second shot because we think he'll be open and he'll have a better chance to win the game for us. And Pippen said, no, I want the ball. And Jackson said, no, 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 this is a better play for the team. And he just kept saying, no, I'm the best player. I should get the ball. I'm the star. And Jackson replaced him. The crowd was going crazy. The announcers were like, why is our best player not on the floor? And as it turned out, Pippen just said, listen, winning's great, but it's first and foremost about me. And I like to say that I wish every team had people with Scotty Pippen on it that could admit that it wasn't about the team, it was about them, because then we know who to fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But the point is, we don't come out of the womb, Molly, thinking about the team, we come out thinking about ourselves. So when we talk about inattention to results, we're talking about inattention to the collective results, the greater good of the team over your own individual needs. It's not about your budget, it's not about your department, it's not about your career, it's about the team. Right, nice, nice. So... What are some things that you would recommend organizations do to create um, real clear goals to help them with, with these results? Is there any tools or anything like that that you recommend that folks use? Yes. We have, this, um, we have this belief that every team at any given point in time needs to have what we call a thematic goal. We, a better term is a rallying cry. I, I would have called it that. Had I thought. So every team needs to have one big thing that matters most for the whole team. So you can't just say, hey, marketing, what are your goals this quarter? Hey, sales, what are yours? It's like, what's the one thing that regardless of what de department we're in that this company, this team, this organization needs to get done in the next six months or five months or whatever. And now, once we know what that is, then what has to happen in order for that to get done? And then we'll talk about our roles and responsibilities. Too often, we, we do it like a, in silos where we ask each silo what their goals are going to be and hope it adds up at the end. We function like a golf team rather than a basketball team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got it. Where everybody just goes and does their own thing. We add up the scores at the end of the month. So we tell our teams, commit to what you're the most important priority, what we're going to do as a collective team to get those done. Then we'll talk about departments and what they do. Got it. So trickle down from the top really high. Like Cokes is open happiness, right? Yes. So trickle down from there. Got it. Okay. And I loved death by meeting, right? You talk about meetings, which bad meetings can be a real culture killer you talk about, right? What are some tips for better meetings in addition to what you just shared? Well, the first thing is conflict is necessary for a great meeting. And I learned this as a screenwriter. I, I wrote screenplays for fun after college. And any story, any, even in my books, when I, I'm writing a book right now, when I'm writing it, I have to say there has to be something at stake here. There has to be something that somebody wants and tension about whether they're going to get that. Because if that's not true, nobody wants to hear it. And every great movie, whether it's a lighthearted romantic comedy or an action movie or whatever it is, any great movie has to have conflict at the core, and that's why people care. And when we try to have meetings without conflict, when we paper over our differences of opinions or downplay threats, we deprive people of the joy of going to a really interesting meeting. What I say at the beginning of meetings is the leader's job is to put the, the biggest, hairiest issue on the table first and say, listen, you guys, if we don't deal with this, we're host. And people should be a little bit worried. And then you resolve it, and that's what makes it interesting. So conflict, Molly, conflict is the first and critical thing. When we have peaceful, boring meetings, we shouldn't be surprised that we're making bad decisions. And so if you had to narrow it down to one thing that you think is the biggest mistake that leaders make with all the work that you've done, all the books that you've written, all the companies that you've helped, 
What do you think is the one thing? Well, it's interesting because I'm working on something around this right now. I think that one of the biggest mistakes that leaders make is one that they, they don't even realize they've made, and it's they're going to leadership for the wrong reason. And then nothing else works and they can't figure out why. You see, there's, becoming a leader is not meant to be a reward. It's meant to be a responsibility. So when people say, I want to be a leader, I want to be the CEO, I want to be the head coach, and then they get the job, some people think, man, I've arrived. I've finally succeeded. This is fabulous. And it's like, it's the reward for a lifetime of hard work, as opposed to, oh my gosh, now the hard work just begins. And so many leaders I work with, I say to them, you have to have this difficult conversation. You have to enter into this. You have to go to these meetings. You have to do all these difficult things. And they're like, why? I don't have to anymore. I'm the leader. (laughs) You have to do it more now. Exactly. Sure. Sure. But they've got to have a clear purpose, too, is what I'm hearing you say. They've got to know why they're even sitting there. Yep. Okay. It's like a parent. Like, and you have three girls. I have four boys. We should get them together. Right. (laughs) Yeah, because I'd have to pay for the weddings, right? (laughs) There you go. I'm happy for that. But if you go into parenting thinking, wow, this is just, this is about fun and it's about um, having an accoutrement in my life that that makes my life better. Well, you're not going to want to go to Chuck E. Cheese very much or, or, or get on the floor and play games. But if you go into it saying, hey, this is hard work and it's for them then you're going to be much more likely to embrace all the hard stuff about being a parent. So the biggest mistake leaders make is they forget that this is not a reward. It's a huge responsibility. And if you're not becoming a leader to do hard work, then you should not be a leader. Oh, I love that. So, you know, one of your recent books, which I love, is The Ideal Team Player. And, you know, the entire book is about that, right? But so we've spent a lot of time on the five dysfunctions. But just real quick for our listeners, what would you say it makes you an ideal team player? And this book is the prequel, if you will, to the, to the five dysfunctions, because we realized later on that people would ask us, like, what kind of a person makes, is good at overcoming the five dysfunctions? What kind of people should I hire or look for? And we, we didn't know. But we went back and discovered that, in fact, our core values as a firm lined up with this, and our clients were interested in it. They thought there was some universal appeal to our core values, and we realized, oh, my gosh, these are the three requirements for a team player. And so the three are you have to be humble. And a humble person is much more likely to be vulnerable and to receive conflict well and do all those things. So humble is important. Humble is not thinking less of yourself. C.S. Lewis once said, humble is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. I love that line. Yes. So if you're a great talent in something, it's not denying that talent. That's a violation of humility. It's realizing you don't have to tell people about it all the time or, or make it about you. So humility means you're more interested in others than you are the team and you're not insecure. I'm okay, and I know I'm good at certain things, but I'm not good at others, and I'm going to do my best for others. So humble is the first one, and it's the most important. The next one is hungry. You have to have a desire to do more and to be better. It can't be motivated by doing the minimum. It can't be a coach or a manager that tells you. It's like you just, the idea of being a slacker is just so antithetical. So hire people that are humble, hire people that are hungry, that have a work ethic. And then the last one is smart, but it's not intellectually smart it's interpersonally smart. It's like, do you have common sense around people? Do you know that when you say certain things, it's going to impact them this way? If somebody's upset at a meeting, do you realize that and you go and talk to them about it? Or do you just not notice or not care? Sure. So if you find people that are humble, not arrogant, hungry, not minimalist or or lazy, and smart, not awkward around people, but really good at understanding people, they slide right into the five dysfunctions and overcome them. If a person's egregiously lacking in any molly, it's really hard. Sure, sure. Well, and I love this book, and I love the way you write your fables. Obviously, there is just the, the way you apply it at the end, and you tied the five dysfunctions to this one, which I thought was really cool. And, you know, I read it, and then, Patrick, I was at my daughter's volleyball tournament, and when she was not playing, I had my earbuds in, and I was listening to it, too. So it's that good. All your stuff is that good. But you offer so many resources, and... and Besides your books, you mentioned before we went, went live, May 10th in the Bay Area, you're doing a public event. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about that and anything else they can do to get in your world a little bit more and learn from you? There's so much to learn from you. Yeah, you know, I do a lot of talking, Molly, but I, I speak for companies and at, at conferences. And people said, when are you just going to do something that anybody can sign up for and go to? So um, 
my sons go to Santa Clara University, and we've partnered with them around some things, and we're located fairly close to them. And so we, on May 10th, we're going to have our first ever public event, a half day, where I'm going to go through all of our material, and, and it's, it's limited to like 500 people. So it's five minutes away from the San Jose Airport in the Silicon Valley. And so there's still spots available, and um, we just announced it not very long ago. And so we're going to be there meeting people and speaking um, for a half day on all the stuff that we're talking about and answering questions. So if you're a practitioner or a leader or a manager that's interested in this stuff, we'd encourage you to take a look at that. And is that at thetablegroup.com? Yeah, you can find out all of our stuff at tablegroup.com. Got it. Okay. And what are some of your, your personal favorite books, podcasts, apps that you consume content from? Well, Henry Cloud is one of my favorite people mm-hmm, on the planet. Mm-hmm. Just man. a great guy, wise. You know, and, and I could just sit and listen to him talk about just about anything. So I, I like all the stuff he does, and that's fabulous. I go back to reading uh, Jim Collins' uh, Built to Last, actually the book he wrote with Jerry Porras, the first one. I really loved that. Um, that's good stuff. And uh, I was recently on Donald Miller's podcast and had a chance to do the story brand stuff. I think that was really interesting, it's too. good stuff, too. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so um, Patrick, we end with rapid fire, and so I'm going to fire some questions, and you just tell me what comes up for you. Does that sound good? Sure. Awesome. Okay, the last book you read. Oh, wow. I've got a few. I'm reading, I read mostly faith books, Mm -hmm. and um, gee, what would be the last one? This is really hard, because I'm writing right now, so I'm not doing a lot of reading. What's sitting near my nightstand? There's this book called This Tremendous Lover, which is crazy. It sounds like a a Harlequin romance, but it's about (laughs) Jesus. Okay. It's by a guy named Eugene Bolin. Neat, and you like it? Yeah, it's really good. It's deep, though. It's very thick. It's like when, when people ask me for book recommendations, and I'll tell them Get Naked by you. Yeah. Right? And it sounds, they're like, whoa, what's that about? Yeah, my, my mom is so mad at me every time we send her. She goes, send me some books. And then she said, don't send me that one. It's embarrassing. <laughs> what is one book that you think every leader should read? Wow, a, leadership i've written you know oh my gosh what book every leader should read well I'll start with the bible of course because there's so much in there and and there's so many good books you know i the one minute manager i read years ago and that had a big influence on me by ken blanchard that would be very up there on the list gosh i should have a better answer to this question i read a lot for a business person built to last is one i always tell mm-hmm. people yeah read that one mm-hmm. right after the this call i'm gonna go, oh my gosh, I forgot to tell her about this one. <laughs> well, if you were looking, right, I have a bookshelf in my office, and so uh, that's all my favorite ones. So Mine's out in the hallway. Right, the books that's I have in my office. Up. Yeah, that's yeah. what's jamming you up right now. Right. What's your morning routine, Patrick? How do you start your day? Okay, I like to wake up and pray the rosary. I'm a mm, Catholic, yeah. and I'm an ENFP, so discipline is hard for me, and I realize that when I do that, everything is different because mm. I, okay. I'm praying and I'm putting myself in the presence of God for an extended period of time. It takes about 15 minutes, which is a long time for an ENFP. And then I, uh, I try not to eat too much because if I do that, I, I try to, to be a little bit more lean about things in the morning. And then if I can go to mass, I do that. I was able to do that today. And then if I do those things, I'm fine. It's really easy for me to dive right into my day right the moment I wake up and that's a bad thing. So I don't look at my phone. I don't look at my email. I don't start thinking about all the things I need to do. I try to be with God first and then let things go from there. Mm, That is, I didn't know that. I I didn't know you were Catholic. I knew you were a man of faith, but my husband and I are Catholic too. So that's cool. Oh, you are. We are. We are. I've I've really gotten about 40% of my time at work now. I'm spending serving the church in doing a thing called the amazing parish, which is working Mm. with priests and their Mm. staff members. Oh, wow. Neat. Well, you know, what is a team that you admire, right? You, you know, it could be a company or even a sports team. I really admire the folks at Southwest Airlines. Mm-hmm. Southwest is one of those companies, and we've had, a, we've had the privilege of working with them. They were great long before they ever became friends of ours. But the reality at Southwest is better than what you hear. You know, there's, most companies have a big shadow culture where it's like, they're the greatest company. It's Disneyland. It's the happiest place on earth. And then, you know, Mickey and Donald are punching each other out while they're smoking cigarettes. But it's an amazing company. The the, the culture there, and it starts at the executive level. The executives at Chick-fil-A, we work with them too. What I admire about, they're not perfect. Nobody's perfect, but they really live what they preach. They really care about each other and do things for one another. I love that. Um, the San Antonio Spurs, I've always loved the Spurs. Pound the, the Rock. Warriors, right? 
Steph Curry lives around the corner from me in a, in a much larger house than mine, by the way. <laughs> but they're doing some really good things in the world of sports. What's the best advice you've ever received? You know, I've received a lot of good advice, but a, a guy pulled me aside probably, would it be, 21 years ago now, and said to me, he was an executive at a company I worked at before I started my own firm, and I didn't know him that well. And we were in a meeting, and he said, Pat, um, do you have kids? And I said, no, no, we, I've just gotten married recently. And he said, okay, when you do have kids, I w- really spend time with them, because I have a 16-year-old son, and I don't even know him. Okay, let's get on with the meeting. And wow, it, interesting. I have never forgotten that, and I don't travel as much as I would have in my job. I have opportunities that I turn down, because it's, if I'm not a good husband and parent, then what does it matter? So that was advice that stuck with me and changed my life. It was very vulnerable, too, for him to say that to me. I'm really, really grateful that he would do that. Does he know the impact that's had on you, I wonder? You know, I, I don't even know where he is. It was okay. I, He was an executive. I was a relatively junior person. Okay. So, no, but I should, you know, I should track him down and let him know that. Well, I'm sure your son should, too, and thank him, because uh, you've been clearly very present as a dad, which is um, huge. I couldn't agree more. So, Patrick, we're going to wrap here. The, the show's called Game Changers. So, my last question to you is, what Game Changer inspires you and why? So somebody that you think of as a real game changer in life, who is that and and what is it that they do that inspires you? That's a great question. That's a great, you know, when I was in high school, I was a, uh, I played football and basketball, but I also was a distance runner, which is a weird combo, but there was a coach I had named Joel Mena and he took an interest in me and was unafraid and was very vulnerable in life and very comfortable just being himself. And he really influenced me to be myself and to put things into life. And it's interesting. He made a big impact on me. And then a month before I went away to college, he was killed in a car accident. He was like a, he was like a brother to me. Mm. And that was a game changer. I think that he kind of taught me how to, how to celebrate who I was and to pour into people and, and not worry about the consequences. Nice. Wow. That's, uh, that's an awesome story. Patrick, I had the opportunity to meet you uh, years ago, and I just can't thank you enough. Your work is so um, incredible, and I know you change and impact so many lives in so many incredible ways. So I know our listeners will absolutely dig this. This is great stuff. Thank you, Molly. You know, being on these podcasts, I love being on these podcasts, except I'm being asked all the questions. And if this were a conversation, I'd be asking you a lot more questions because I'd like to know more (laughs) about you and your girls. So it's a weird thing to be like, okay, I didn't learn anything about you. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Well, you are uh, you are kind. Well, thank you for everything you do. Thanks, Molly. God bless you. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.